wave dispersion and polarization. We're talking about two things here, something called the dispersion relation, which is a rule that our wave vector has to follow, and then the electromagnetic wave polarization. This is where we'll talk more about this polarization vector and really what that means to a wave propagating and why that's even important to consider. Dispersion relation. So we started with the wave equation and we derived a plane wave solution to that. I'm going to skip a long derivation here, but it turns out if we take this solution, plug that back into our wave equation and turn our algebra crank, what comes out is something called the dispersion relation. And it's a rule that our wave vector has to follow. Fundamentally, the dispersion relation is defined as something that relates frequency to wave vector. Uh, I like to think of it as just a rule that the wave vector has to follow as a function of direction. It turns out, depending on the direction of the wave, the magnitude of the wave vector could change. And so that sets limits on what the different various components could be. So this is called the dispersion relation. And let's think of some ways that we can visualize this. So at the upper left is our dispersion relation for a linear homogeneous isotropic material. And if we stare at this long enough, and remember from our calculus, we might remember this is actually the equation for a sphere where K naught times N is the radius. And in fact, that defines a sphere and we can draw that and that is called the index ellipsoid. So going back to this picture of the magnitude of the wave vector conveying refractive index, the index ellipsoid can, we can think of that as a map of refractive index as a function of direction. So if we pick a direction and we start at the origin and we head out in that direction, where that intersects the surface of that index ellipsoid, that magnitude will be the refractive index. Well, if it's a sphere, that's kind of boring. No matter what direction the wave is going, it sees the same refractive index. But what we'll see is that in different materials, that can be very different. So in isotropic materials, we have nice spherical index ellipsoids. Well, it turns out in anisotropic materials, these can take on different shapes. There's things called uniaxial materials, and our index ellipsoids are actually ellipses. And then there's biaxial materials that have equally strange index ellipsoids. So now as a wave changes direction, it can see a different refractive index. And in fact, it can see multiple refractive indices at the same time. And this leads to things like double refraction. There are certain crystals that you can look through, even with just one eye, and see a double image. So unfortunately, there's lots of cool stuff happening with anisotropy. It's just not something we're going to talk about in this class, but I wanted to point you to it. And things get even stranger than this if the material the wave is traveling through is periodic and then the wave starts bouncing around and scattering. Some really crazy, mysterious things can happen. On to electromagnetic wave polarization. So right now, we are talking about a wave in a vacuum. It's not yet interacting with a device. And it turns out our discussion of polarization changes a little bit when we're talking about devices. So right now we just have a wave in this infinite homogeneous medium. Think of it as outer space or air or anything. It's just homogeneous. And there's two types, two main polarizations. There's linear polarization. And in a linearly polarized wave, the electric field is constantly oscillating in a plane. It turns out there's something else it can do. It can actually rotate about the axis that it's traveling down. And we call that a circularly polarized wave. And it'll also turn out instead of circles, it can trace ellipses and that's called elliptical polarization. And in fact, I could argue elliptical polarization is the only one that exists it's just that linear and circular polarization are two special cases of the elliptical polarization. 
So from our curl equations, we can show that the electric and magnetic fields are perpendicular to each other. From the divergence equations, we can show that the electric field is perpendicular to the direction the wave is going. The magnetic field is also perpendicular to the wave is going. And from the first one, electric and magnetic fields are perpendicular. So everything's perpendicular here. E, H, and K are all perpendicular, and they follow this right-hand rule. If you stick your thumb, your forefinger, and your middle finger out so that they form as close to 90 degrees with respect to each other as possible, your thumb is pointing in the direction the wave is going, your index finger is pointing in the direction of the electric field, and H, or the, sorry, your middle finger is pointing in the direction of the magnetic field. And this handedness always has to be the case. And this handedness will come up in some future lectures. So wave polarization is defined completely in terms of the electric field. And we know the electric field is perpendicular to the direction the wave is going. So what I'm showing on this slide is, is the wave vector. This is the direction the wave is going. That means we have this plane. And somewhere in this plane is how our electric field is polarized. And it can be anywhere in that plane. So we can pick two arbitrary directions, A and B. The only rule that we have to follow is that A and B are perpendicular to each other and also perpendicular to K. So if we have those unit vectors, we can write the overall polarization vector as some number in the direction of A and some number in the direction of B. And the picture of that is over here. So A and B don't necessarily need to follow X or Y directions exactly because this wave could be traveling in some arbitrary direction. So this is the most general description of polarization. And right now our choice of A and B does not matter. Maybe we can pick them that will make the math simpler, but physically they don't matter. When we start getting to devices in later lectures, the directions that we pick for A and B will become important. But right now, it does not matter what directions we pick. We'll just pick them to make the math simpler. So we'll take this expression for our polarization vector and actually plug it into our equation. What we would like to get is an expression for our electric field that shows all of this polarization information explicitly. So we substituted in what we got on the last slide. And so our, in the A direction, we have some number, or the amplitude in the A direction, and some number in the B direction. And they can be different. In fact, they're complex numbers because they can not only be different amplitudes, those two directions can have electric fields oscillating out of phase. So in the most general setting, we can give the, the PA an amplitude of EA and then a phase phi A. And then in the B direction, we'll give it a magnitude EB and a phase EB. And then we can take these and plug them back into our expression for the electric field. So that's exactly what we're going to do now. And we end up here. So the next step that we're going to do here is factor out this e to the j phi a. We're going to bring that to the outside. And then we'll have to also subtract it from this term. When we do that, this EA term no longer has a phi A. The second one has a phi B minus a phi A, and then we factored out E to the J phi A. So this phi B minus phi A, that is the phase difference between the A and the B polarizations. And so we'll just call that phase difference delta. This phi A term is the phase that's common to both A and B once we assign this as the phase to the B direction. And it turns out in terms of polarization, this term and of course the oscillating term does not impact polarization at all. So the new way that we're writing the electric field is just has an EA, a real number in the A direction, EB, a real number in the B direction, but also a phase in the B direction. And then of course a common phase which won't factor into our polarization. So our polarization is now completely described by three numbers, EA, EB, and delta.
So here's our expression. I defined the terms on the right. And now we're in a, in a position where we can look at this equation. If there's numbers sitting there, we can figure out what polarization that represents. And here's a nice table summarizing all of it. So if I'm given an expression for a plane wave, the first thing I'll do is manipulate it to be in this form. And then I'll get EA, EB, and delta and figure out what to do with that. Well, if delta is zero, so the A and B polarization directions are in phase, it doesn't matter what EA and EB are. If they're in phase, we have a linear polarization. The magnitudes of EA and B, we will only change the orientation of that linear polarization. So if they're in phase, it's linear no matter what. Okay, next thing, we'll look at that delta. If they're 90 degrees out of phase, potentially we have a circular polarization, but there's something else we have to look for. In this case, to be circle, for the electric field to rotate around a circle, EA and EB have to be the same magnitude. If they're not, it's actually gonna trace out an ellipse. So if that delta is 90 degrees and EA and EB are equal, we have a circularly polarized wave. We can then look at the sine of that 90 degrees. If it is a positive 90 degrees, we will call that right-hand circularly polarized. And if it's negative, we'll call that left-hand circularly polarized. If our polarization doesn't fall into any of those categories, it's an elliptical polarization. So if we have a linearly polarized wave, here's a simple example of a wave traveling in the Z direction. That means this polarization vector is defined in the X and Y directions. Here it's convenient to choose X to be our A direction and y to be our b direction. That wasn't necessary, but it makes the math cleaner. And so we can orient our polarization vector anywhere in that plane. And if it's at an angle theta, well, we'll just give it a sine theta in the x direction and a cosine theta in the y direction. And these two terms are in phase. So we have a linear polarization at some angle theta in that xy plane. Now, if we have a wave traveling in an arbitrary direction, it's really the same expression for the linearly polarized wave. It's just now we have a sine theta in the A direction and a cosine theta in the B direction. And just to remind ourselves, A and B and K, K being the direction of the wave, those all have to be 90 degrees with respect to each other. So over on the right, here's where we're showing that. We have the direction of the wave and we define the A direction being this way and the, the B direction being this way. And that does not necessarily have to be along an X, Y, or Z axis. It can be in some other arbitrary direction. But as long as an A and a B direction are in phase, we have a linearly polarized wave. So here's a visualization of a linearly polarized wave. And, you know, we've been ignoring the magnetic field talking about polarization, and that's simply because whatever the electric field does, the magnetic field does the same thing. So we don't need to look at it for polarization. Here we have a linearly polarized E, well, we'll have a linearly polarized H. So polarization is just defined in terms of the electric field. All the information we need is contained there. The H field isn't a copy of E, but it's fixed given an E. Onto a circularly polarized wave. First, for a wave traveling in the z direction, and we have a polarization vector, that means the amplitude in the x and y directions have to be the same. So we have a 1 here and a j. Those have the same magnitudes. However, the j adds 90 degree phase. And I put a plus and minus here for left or right hand circularly polarized. So the, the two, the a and b directions have the same magnitude and they're 90 degrees out of phase, that is a circularly polarized wave. Let's look at this for an arbitrary direction. So we have our plane wave term, our polarization vector, and it looks the same as we did above, except we have an A and a B direction. They have the same amplitudes, the A and B direction, they're just 90 degrees out of phase. And the plus and minus is for left or circular. 
And so if we were to look at the electric field, we would actually see it rotating around the axis of propagation as it propagates. And we can have left or right hand circular. Now, if we add two linearly polarized waves together, so we'll have a linear polarization in the y direction, another linear polarization in the x direction, what we actually get is a composite linear polarization along the diagonal. And then, of course, if we change the amplitude, let's say we made the x direction a little bit smaller, well, the composite polarization would look like it's oscillating a little bit more vertically. So we can change the orientation of that composite linear polarization just by controlling the amplitudes of the linear polarization in the A and B directions. So two linear polarizations added together, if they're in phase, form another linear polarization. Now, if we take two linear polarizations that are in the A and B directions and we make them 90 degrees out of phase, we get a circularly polarized wave. So in fact, in a lot of ways, it may be useful to think that there really is no such thing as a circularly polarized wave. There's only linear polarizations. It's just that when we have two linears and they're 90 degrees out of phase, if we were to trace the electric field, it would rotate about the axis. So that's a, a circularly polarized wave. And whether it's positive or minus 90 degrees changes whether it's a right-hand or a left-hand circularly polarized wave. Now this is sort of neat. In the last slide, we added two linear polarizations and got a circular polarization. Here, Let's say we have two circularly polarized waves and we add those together. It turns out we get a linearly polarized wave. Now, when we added the two linears, that phase had to be exactly 90 degrees where we wouldn't get circular. Here, no matter what, if we add two circularly polarized waves, we'll get a linear. As those two waves go in and out of phase, all that does to linear polarization is rotate it. So we can control the orientation of that composite linear polarization simply by the phase between the two circularly polarized waves. Now this is a trap that you don't want to fall into, but it turns out different disciplines look at polarization differently. And they also treat square root of negative one differently too. So engineering, which is what we are, uh, tends to look at circular polarization from the from the uh, the source's perspective. So the source is emitting, the wave is moving away, and we watch the direction that the wave circulates, and we define left or right hand circularly polarized from that perspective. Now, optics people, when I was getting my degree in optics, I suddenly became very confused because it seemed like I thought I understood polarization and all of a sudden things are different. And I finally figured out that these optics people just have a opposite definition of polarization. They're looking at polarization from the detector perspective with the wave coming at them. And so what a, an electrical engineer would define as a right-hand circular wave would actually be a left-hand circularly polarized wave for an optics person. Now us as engineering, we're going to stick with what we're showing on the left. So we'll be looking at waves as they move away from us. And if we stare at this long enough, we can see that that electric field is actually rotating in the clockwise direction. And so we define that as a right-hand circularly polarized wave. Similarly, if we're an electrical engineer, we're looking at this wave moving away from us and we look at the composite wave right in that XY plane, we see that that's rotating counterclockwise. And so we would call that a left-hand circularly polarized wave. Now an optics person would call this a right-hand circularly polarized wave because they're looking at it from the perspective of the wave coming toward them. So be cautious of those definitions. In this course, we're electrical engineers. And so we look at it from a perspective of the wave moving away from us. Here's a side topic that I think you'll find fun or interesting or even useful. And it's called a Poincaré sphere. And every possible polarization is mapped to some point on this Poincaré sphere. 
Now around the equator, if we're thinking of this as a, a planet, around the equator are all of the linear polarizations. So let's say we're, we're right here. We'll call that a zero degree linear polarization. So it's the, the electric field will be oscillating vertically. When we rotate by 90 degrees, now we're looking at a polarization that's rotated by 45 degrees. It's a, still a linear polarization. We rotate another 45 degrees and the polarization, I'm sorry, we rotate by another 90 degrees, the polarization rotates another 45 degrees. And so we rotate then around the Poincaré sphere another 90 degrees, the polarization rotates yet another 45 degrees. And by the time we come back here, we're back to our original polarization. So the equator is mapping out all linear polarizations. Now the North and South Pole, that's our right-hand circularly polarized wave and a left-hand circularly polarized wave. Every other point on the sphere is an elliptical polarization. Now what's one of the utilities of this Poincaré sphere? Well, what we'll see is that polarization is very important when we want waves to interfere with each other. And when waves don't interfere with each other, it's because their polarizations are perpendicular to each other. We call that orthogonal. And so when we talk about right hand and left hand, the, those being perpendicular with respect to each other doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but they can still be orthogonal and they won't produce interference. And it turns out at opposite points on this Poincaré sphere, those polarizations are orthogonal. They won't interfere with each other. Uh, any other points on the two points on the Poincaré sphere will produce interference. Now, why is polarization important? Let's take this one point at a time. So device behavior can become very different depending on polarization. Um, Take an optical waveguide, for example, or a dielectric waveguide. We can excite it with something linearly polarized in X, and we can excite it with something linearly polarized in Y. If that waveguide is traveling in the Z direction, we could see completely different propagation characteristics just due to the polarization. If we have a ruled diffraction grating, the little tiny lines drawn on something, and the light hits that and, and it diffracts, we will see different patterns depending on polarization. So devices just behave differently with different polarizations. Already mentioned this, but when waves pass through each other, they'll produce interference in these really interesting kind of cool speckle patterns. Uh, but if they're orthogonally polarized, so the electric fields are just completely different, they're never sharing a common direction at any one point in time, they won't interfere. Nothing interesting would happen there. Sometimes we want that, other times we don't. When we analyze devices on the scale of a wavelength, this tends to be where the polarization is very important. If the feature sizes become absolutely enormous, then polarization tends to be less important. That's kind of interesting. So if we're looking at reflection off of glass, for example, that glass is huge relative to the wavelength and we don't really see polarization effects off of that. Now when we put a polarizing film on things and then we look at the polarizing film through polarized sunglasses and we tilt our head back and forth or if you put on polarized sunglasses you look at your cell phone which has a liquid crystal display and then you can rotate the orientation your display will go black and then bright and that's because there's things happening on the scale of a wavelength and that does become very important. Large devices tend not to polarize things. If we have a lens, it will focus differently in the X and Y directions. That could be a mistake in a lens, but also if the lens is perfect, if we just have a wave, a beam hitting that lens that's linearly polarized, it will focus differently in the X and Y directions. Usually we don't want that. When we bounce waves off of things, we'll see later on, this is described by the Fresnel equations, but different polarizations reflect and transmit differently at an interface. If we're analyzing resonators, their frequency and the mode profile can be profoundly polarization sensitive. When we look at cutoff conditions, you know, waveguides, they pipe energy down to a certain frequency. 
Well, those cutoff conditions for filters and waveguides and things, that can also be polarization sensitive. So polarization is very important, particularly when the size of the device is on the scale of a wavelength. Let's give an example. And I came up with probably the hardest example in the world here, just to illustrate everything. So our problem is we have a wave, and here's the expression for the wave. Holy smokes, look how complicated that is. And I wrote different numbers in X, Y, and Z directions, and we have to try to figure out what's going on here. But it's a 5.6 gigahertz plane wave. And we want to do seven different things. What is the wave vector? That's going to tell us the direction the wave is moving in, and the magnitude of that will also tell us wavelength. And so that's question two, determine the wavelength inside the medium. Then we'll have to determine the free space wavelength. We'll determine the refractive index of the medium that this wave is traveling through. We'll have to determine the dielectric constant of the medium. What's the polarization of the wave? And then what is the magnitude of the wave? So I really don't think I would ever give you a problem this hard on homework or test. Uh, maybe if I was in a really bad mood. <laughs> but if you can do this, you can do all the other ones. This is the most generic thing that I could come up with. The first thing we want to do is determine the wave vector. And so what I like to do is take this big, weird, ugly expression and put it in our standard form. And in this case, our standard form is a polarization vector multiplying this complex exponential with an e to the minus j k dot r. So let's do that. So if we stare at that big, ugly expression for our plane wave on the previous slide long enough, what we'll see is that we pull out all of these amplitude terms pull out the amplitude term in the x direction, the y direction, the z direction, and that together forms our polarization vector. We also had these three complex exponentials and we group them together and that is somehow e to the minus j k dot r. Now at this point we'll just remember our polarization vector. We will use that again later. But we do need this e to the minus jkr expression that we've come up with. So e to the jkr, if we expand this dot product, we get e to the minus jkx times x, e to the minus jky times y, and e to the minus jkz times z. And if we look at this, what we can see is, hey, this term must be this. So in other words, that number sitting there must be our kx, the x component of our wave vector. Then we can look at this complex exponential, e to the minus jky times y. Well, if we look at this term, that means this 330.8676 number must be the y component of our wave vector. And this number must be the z component of our wave vector. So we pull all that together and we can write our wave vector. And it tells us the direction and it's in some strange direction. The units of that are inverse meters, right? Because it's 2 pi over wavelength. The 2 pi doesn't have units, but wavelength has units of meters. So our wave vector has units of inverse meters. So we found the wave vector just by putting our plane wave in a standard form that let us read off the wave vector. Next thing is to determine the wavelength inside the medium. Well, we've done most of the work here by determining the wave vector. And remember, the wave vector is 2 pi over wavelength. And so if we solve that equation for wavelength, then we can determine that as 2 pi over the magnitude of our wave vector. So let's go ahead and do that. First, we calculate the magnitude of the wave vector, and we end up getting about 704 inverse meters. Well, then 2, divide, 2 pi divided by that gives us 8.9224 centimeters. So 9 centimeters is our wavelength. This is the wavelength inside whatever medium it is this wave is propagating through. We haven't really determined that yet. This is not the free space wavelength. That's why I wrote this just as lambda and not lambda sub naught. All right, what is the free space wavelength? Well, we have this relation C naught equals F lambda. So lambda is the speed of light divided by frequency. Well, we know the speed of light, that's three times 10 to the eight. 
and the frequency was given. It was a 5.6 gigahertz wave. So the free space wavelength is 53.53 centimeters. What is refractive index? Well, we know the free space wavelength. And we also know from some animations that we saw previously, when a wave enters a material with a higher refractive index, that wave is reduced in period. So the wavelength inside the medium is the free space wavelength divided by refractive index. So we solve this for refractive index, and it's the free space wavelength divided by whatever the wavelength is. Well, we just calculated the free space wavelength and then before that, from the magnitude of the wave vector, we got the wavelength and we divide the two. And it turns out this wave is traveling through a medium with a refractive index of six. That is a really, really high refractive index. There's an alternate way we could have determined refractive index. Remember, we said that the magnitude of the wave vector, when frequency is known, conveys refractive index. And in this case, frequency is known. We can calculate this K naught. That's just two pi over the free space wavelength. So let's do some math here. Refractive index will be the magnitude of our wave vector divided by K naught, which is the free space wave number. We also know that the free space wave number is omega over C naught. Omega is two pi F, and we brought the C naught to the top. And we can use this expression to get refractive index. So we have the, the speed of light, magnitude of our wave vector, 2 pi times frequency, and we also get 6.0. So magnitude of K can convey refractive index. Two different ways of doing it. The dielectric constant. Well, we said that this does not have a magnetic response, or if it wasn't said, we will assume that. So if nothing's ever said about permeability, it's almost always okay. Just assume there's no magnetic response. And so in which case, the refractive index will just be the square root of the relative permittivity. There was a relative permeability there, but we're ignoring that. That's just a one. So we solve this for the permittivity, that is refractive index squared, and we get a value of 36 for the permittivity. Wave polarization. To determine the wave polarization, we want to take our expression for the plane wave and express it in this form, which makes the polarization explicit. So we have some work to do. So to do this, we have to determine some kind of directions for A and B. And it does not matter which directions we pick as long as they're perpendicular to each other and perpendicular to K. So we have this first task to do. How do we choose A and B? So one way we can do this is just to pick some random vector. So I just pick something. The only thing that's important about this vector is that it is not in the same direction as K. So I just made one up. Uh, you know, one unit in the X direction, two in the Y, three in the Z. As long as it's not K, we can proceed. The cross product always gives us a vector perpendicular to the two vectors used in the cross product. So we take this arbitrary vector that I just picked that just wasn't K, wasn't in the same direction as K. So if I calculate a cross product, I'm guaranteed to get a vector that is perpendicular to K. It will also be perpendicular to this vector V, but I don't really care about V. I just wanted something that was perpendicular to K. And of course, I divide by the magnitude of that cross product to give me a unit vector. So this is a unit vector that is perpendicular to K. Given that, we'll use a cross product again to get yet a third vector. The cross product of K and A gives us another vector that is perpendicular to both K and A. So A and B are perpendicular with respect to each other, and they're also both perpendicular to K. And of course, we divide by the magnitude of that cross product. That gives us a unit vector. So these two unit vectors are perpendicular. And if we wanted to prove that, we would just calculate A dot B, and we would get zero. 
and we could calculate a dot k or b dot k and we should get zero for all of those dot products. Now we need to know how much of our polarization is in the directions of a and b. So we have our polarization vector. That was on the first slide. We constructed what that is. We do a dot product with a and we get a number. That's the component in the a direction. If we do the same dot product but with b, we get the component in the b direction. So we now know these two polarization terms, pa and pb. From PA and PB, we want to write EA and EB. And so it turns out EA and EB will be 1.6971, and the phase between them is negative 90 degrees. So how do I get this? Well, I'm just reading off the numbers, right? That's the magnitude of these. And then I'm looking at the phase for delta. There's no phase here, but a minus J. That's 90 degrees. The common phase between them is zero degrees, but that doesn't even enter into polarization. We really don't even need that. Okay, so here's where we are. We put everything in our explicit form. We got an EA, an EB, a delta, and the common phase, which we don't need, and our wave vector K. So we go to our table. And the first thing is, is it a linearly polarized wave? Well, the A and B directions have to be in phase, and they're not. It's a, there is a delta that is not zero degrees. So we do not have linearly polarized wave, okay? Do we have something else? Well, it's a 90 degrees, that's a negative 90 degrees. So that clues us in that this might be a circularly polarized wave. But in order to say for sure, it also has to have A, E, A, and E, B, equal and they are equal so we know we have a circularly polarized wave since that delta is a negative 90 degrees we conclude we actually have a left hand circularly polarized wave the very last thing we want to do here is calculate the magnitude of the electric field that tells us how strong the wave is well that's all in this polarization vector we just calculate the magnitude of that and that's simply the square root of ea squared plus eb squared and if we go through the math we get 2.4 volts per meter that is the strength or the amplitude of our wave so that's it for this lecture